peak six capital right. management at peak six capital management, a proprietary options trading firm. Throughout her career, she's traded option volatility strategies of all liquidity profiles and has led both organic and inorganic growth initiatives. Currently, Allison is on the leadership team, overseeing longer duration trading teams, firm-wide strategic initiatives, new trading strategy development, and people growth. Allison is a CFA charter holder. Next is, Te is Ted Semlowitz, the head of alternatives and senior portfolio manager for Invesco's exchange trader funds. In this role, he is responsible for the management of the commodity, volatility, and currency funds. Mr. Sam Lowitz joined Invesco in 2012. Before jo joining the firm, he spent 16 years trading volatility arbitrage and quantitative strategies. He was a member of the Chicago Board of Trade and Eurex Exchanges. Ted holds the Kaya and SEMA designations. And then finally, we have Eric Metz, the Chief Investment Officer at Spider Rock Advisors. In his position, Eric oversees all investment strategies and portfolio management activities. Prior to joining SRA, Eric was the derivative strategist and portfolio manager at River North Capital Management, managing both mutual fund and hedge fund assets. He began his career with the Chicago Trading Company on the floors of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and the CBO. After the trading floors, Eric was a senior trader and partner at both Ronin Capital and Bengal Capital, proprietary trading firms specializing in volatility arbitrage. Eric is a CFA charter holder, a member of the CFA Institute and the CFA Society of Chicago, and a board member of the OIC Institutional Advisory Council. Thank you all for being here tonight. Appreciate it, Rich. Yep, thanks for having us. So I'm gonna start with some prepared questions, but we will open up for Q&A with about 15 to 20 minutes left. Um, feel free to put your questions into the Q&A box. Um, Monique and Kathy are gonna be curating these questions in the event that some might be answered in our discussion, but please feel free to populate your questions in the Q&A as, as we go along, and then we'll kind of read through those. I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to Kathy to have us go through those. Okay, so as I mentioned, buy right strategies are not new. Um, in fact, these are some of the most popular option strategies for decades. Um, Ted, I want to start with you first. In your in uh, your opinion, what's led to the growth of these buy right ETF strategies? Yeah, I mean, the um, you know the growth really started in 2021. And, you know, kind of along with the, you know, the rise in inflation, you know, you think about the CPI was, you know, sub 2% in the first quarter of 2021. And by the summer of 2022, it was touching 9%. You know, at the same time, you had high yield credit spreads, you know, uh, around 2.5%, you know, in the summer of 21. And then by the summer of 2022, those had widened out to 6% and interest rates had, had risen at the time. So a lot of times you think of like trying to, capture income. I think investors look at high yield and I think, you know, buy rate strategies are kind of a competitor to that, just kind of given the the risk profiles of the two. So, you know, during that second half of 21, uh, you had equities rising, you had, you know, but fixed income strategies really struggled. And even, you know, yields on high yield funds and preferreds were, you know, at sub 5% and maybe got up to 6% by the, you know, summer of 2022. But, you know, buy right strategies, you know, you know, over that that you know one year period between the summer of twenty one to summer twenty two, even something so simple as just selling out the money on the S P five hundred, you could earn two percent a month in premiums. So, you know, if you can pay half that out, that's twelve percent return and that kind of gets you over that CPI hurdle. And you have a you know uh, an investment vehicle that's not correlated to fixed income. And so I just think during that time period, people saw, you know, got so concerned about inflation, saw the yield opportunity and saw the opportunity to, you know, own something that wasn't going to be correlated, you know, to rates. And so I, I think the, I would say the biggest motivator was kind of that, kind of that reach for income. Yeah. And I mean, I, are we seeing these largely just in, in equity products or are they in some of the other asset classes too? Uh, you've definitely seen some other asset, you know, there are some, you know, fixed income, you know, covered call strategies coming out, but I would say predominantly the growth has been in equity strategies. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Eric, I, I want to um, pivot to you and maybe you can follow up on your thoughts on the growth. Um, and is it um, only, I mean, we obviously see it in ETFs, but you might, from your seat, you might see this as a growing strategy in like SMA type of accounts, et cetera. Um, you know, what are, what are your thoughts on, 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 the, on this, you know, what's been leading to the growth of these strategies, perhaps? 
Yeah, I think there's a, a multifaceted element to this. So, so one is, you know, we tell clients all the time the the concept of not only after tax returns, but like forward looking returns relative to back tests. And so, if you think about S and P as just kind of the staple equity benchmark, um, look looking backwards, we've compounded it maybe north of eleven. Uh, if you were to, you know. Kager, the the last 10 years of S&P returns. And, and there's not one financial institution out there that is credibly stating anything north of 8% on the go forward. So so I think the forward looking return stream is, is somewhat suppressed relative to the backwards looking return stream. And I think coupled with that is this notion of quantitative easing supporting a lot of equity growth historically, but but with the Fed's mindset of not only equity growth and asset price growth, but also just suppress volatility, right? That's what QE effectively does. Yeah. So with the Fed, you know, in their in their tightening cycle, that's the inverse, right? And so when we think about all of the forces in play, forward-looking equity turns, forward-looking vol being higher than backwards-looking vol, I think inherently um, a, an astute investor is going to look to vol premium selling, volatility management, but also dampened equity returns. And you see, if you get that that multiple pronged force, um, I think there's a tailwind. And then, you know, I think the other piece here is is just taxes, right? So there's, there's a lot of tax discussion in how to think about after tax returns. And so when you marry that with some, some of the estate uh, planning thresholds that are, that are potentially sunsetting in, in 2026, the genesis and the demand for why to do these strategies today is probably higher than than it's ever been. Awesome. There's there's uh especially on the tax side, I want to unpack that a little bit more. But first, I'm going to get Allison's thoughts. Um, Allison, do you sense that this is some new growth in option overriding um, based on these volumes, or do you think that maybe this is just volume that was occurring elsewhere that's kind of shifting over to uh, like prepackaged strategies, et cetera? Yeah, so I would say I think it's new volume. One, when you just look at the data uh, for options volume in the past few years, uh, options volume in ETF and index options has exploded. Um, at the same time, in the single stock option space, it's not growing at that pace, but it's not really coming down either to pre-pandemic lows. So just based on those like high-level you know metrics, I think it's new volume. But I'd say the interesting thing to add in on that too is when you look at these, you know, buy right ETF strategies, it also democratizes options trading for people where people who didn't have the financial means, didn't have the knowledge or didn't have the time can add these to their portfolio. Um, you know, people, you know, before these, if you wanted to trade an option and overwrite it in your personal account, you might have needed to buy 100 shares in order to sell an option to have that position and not everyone has the capital for that if you do have the capital it also takes you know some knowledge of what to do even after selling that option right like that one decision to sell that option leads to kind of a whole web of future decisions of when do you maybe want to close out when do you want to restrike to a different strike price and those are a lot of decisions. And that kind of even leads to the third point of some people don't want to spend the time on that, even if they know how to do it. And I'm going to tell you, I'm one of those people in my personal accounts where I just know I'm not going to spend the time that I need to on doing something like that. So these covered call ETFs actually leads to a lot of people for a lot of different reasons, actually be able to leverage options when they might not have in the past. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And, and you know, not just that, but I think adding on to what you're saying is that a lot of people, even if they wanted to trade options in their account, may not be allowed to, right? That's, be, you know, the, the, you know, it takes a, a lot of hoops you have to go through to get option trading in, into your brokerage yeah. accounts. So, so that's, a, that's a great point. Um, Eric, I want to come back to you we'll come with the next question. And it's been maybe building a little bit on what you're talking about before. Um, do, do you think there's an element, and, you know, and I think, uh, Ted, you mentioned this too, but do you think there's an element like a demographic driver to this? Um, when you think about the growth buyer strategies and ETFs in terms of, you know, the, the you know, when we talk about the desire for yield, et cetera, is that a demographic question? And we we know that you know, we just saw the article in the Wall Street Journal, I think, in the last week about um, the number of baby boomers retiring, how it's, we're going to peak here in 2024 and, and, and at, at a huge level. Is, is that driving this a little bit? 
You know, I don't I don't have the exact demographic data to speak to this. Um, however, intuitively, I would just say that most of our work and most of the industry's work around options is 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 fulcrumed on risk management. And so that concept yields to the to a notion of let's stay rich, not get rich, which leads to a retiree's need to preserve their nest egg have a distributable lifestyle via income and really manage volatility. And so if you add all that up, the demand for what it is options can do above and beyond risk adjusted returns, I just think is inherent in that concept. And so just naturally and intuitively, the demand curve for option-based strategies should be increasing as the baby boomer generation is, you know, entering F, if not, you know, already in in retirement. So I do think there's a there's a philosophical intuitive argument that would say yes. That being said, I would I would also say that institutions that have zero notion of a timeline of retirement and have indefinite horizons, 10, 20, 30, 50 year, you know, cycles are also gravitating towards it. And so I think you have a demographic demand in in the baby boomer notion, but I also think you have a structural demand in the capital markets backdrop that we're all exhibiting with forward-looking equity returns, potentially higher of all, a new regime in rates. Um, those may be correlated concepts, but nonetheless, the, de the desire to evaluate strategies such as this just inherently is higher um, given the capital markets backdrop. Uh, Ted, I'm going to pivot to you and see what, you, what do you think? I mean, I, I went from your seat. What do you guys see in terms of any sort of demographic trends, et cetera? Right. Yeah, I would say, you know, most of our clients are RIAs. Um, so in those conversations, it's twofold. One is to, they want to get more income. And so they're just looking for ways to do that. But the other one too, is just, they want equity exposure, but they want lower volatility. And so they see, whether it's a buy right strategies or some of the option related strategies, it's just a way to to kind of manage ball in the portfolio and to, you know, they still want uh, exposure to the upside in the equity market. So to me, it's kind of a blend of the income and just trying to manage the volatility. Yeah. You know? And as far as the demographics, I think naturally that, you know, the demographics are just shifting. So yes, maybe there are some baby boomers, but um, I do think it's, you know, kind of market wide, you know, demographic wide. You know, I would agree with Eric on that point. Um, Elson, any any thoughts on yield enhancement versus hedging insurance, et cetera? Um, I think right now the focus has been on yield enhancement. Um, that's kind of why obviously we're seeing, you know, strategies like this pop up. Um, you know, especially in a time when, you know, past year, year and a half, we've been talking about potential for a recession, everything like that, you know, there's probably a lot of people out there thinking, you know, how do I hedge my, you know, near to midterm or how do I, you know, enhance my near to midterm exposure if I want to keep it longer term, right? Um, we're also just hearing more about short vol strategies in general lately. There's an Odd Lots podcast, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I highly recommend listening to that. So you're just kind of hearing these, you know, things kind of pop up. So I just, I think that's been in the focus lately. Yeah. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the yields on some of these strategies are quite attractive as Ted, as you were saying before, you know, 12% ish yields, it's, it certainly becomes attractive. Um, Eric, I want to dig in this one with you, because you mentioned before about the kind of the tax related impact and, and the sunset, et cetera. Can you, can you dig into that a little bit and unpack for us? Um, you know, is the, the tax related drivers for, for the popularity of these types of strategies? Certainly. So, you know, most of most of private wealth in the taxable arena um, has long equity portfolios, whether they're tax loss harvesting, direct indexing, tax managed equities or not. That's it's somewhat subordinate to the topic, which is we have a lot of drift. And so the 60-40 client is probably at 75-25, maybe 80-20. And so the natural tendency to rebalance back to, I'll call it home base, has this embedded friction of tax liability of embedded capital gains. You couple that with the MAG-7 narrative, which is real, um, which is just outperforming single securities over and over and over again, and the same phenomenon exhibits with an underlying embedded tax friction. 
And so how do you solve these at a household level or at a model level if you're a portfolio manager with the backdrop of embedded capital gains? And so the notion of you know simple selling calls, buying puts, the 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 ratios of those are are you know more art than science for some, but the idea is can I re reallocate my risk into other things that I need to you know have exposure to without paying tax? That is a core thesis um, across the industry right now, and I think it has been highlighted more than ever given the the bull market of 2023 with the Mag Seven specifically highlighting this phenomenon. But it's a problem. But it's a good problem, but it's a problem. And so derivatives, listed derivatives specifically, are very acute to solving this objective, um, which is a driving force, you know, with frankly, in, in real time, NVIDIA earnings tonight. So we have countless clients that are coming into us with fortuitous problems, namely long NVIDIA um, at various shapes and sizes and, and looking to figure out how to re-risk themselves. Very, um, you know, very interesting for sure. I mean, Allison, I know we talked about a little bit about the ELM structures and 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 the and the tax treatment. Do you want to kind of you know unpack that a little bit too? Yeah. So let me start off by saying I'm not a tax expert. I'm an <laughs> options trader. So let's just get that out of the way now. But um, I know certain products like the of this, like Jeppy, that use ELNs, you know, short term equity linked notes as a way to transform that short um, call premium from a short-term capital gains, how it would be taxed into more ordinary income. So I know that there's some, I don't know all products, how they're structured, anything like that, but I do know that there's um, some out there that do have some interesting tax treatments. I was just going to add to that, that, you know, uh... So our fund has to follow the straddle rule. And I think the equity link notes just a, a way to get around, effectively get around that, right? Because straddle rule just means the options are viewed as a hedge to the underlying equity. So at the end of the year, we have to pay out all the gains, whether the equities and options. So I think the equity link notes just now that is viewed as another asset in the fund and you don't necessarily, you may not necessarily have to pay out all the gains. You just, you know, uh, so I, I think it just kind of allows mm -hmm a lot of these covered call strategies to kind of manage that, make them more tax efficient than what they might already be. Yeah. Okay. That, no, that's, that's um definitely, that makes a lot of sense. Um, So I, I want to dig into it maybe from a different angle, because, you know, a lot of people are, that I talk to are wondering about the potential risk that develops in the market because of option strategies, particularly short option strategies. I think some refer back to, the short volatility strategies of 2016 and 17. Um, for those that don't remember, the, the, the short fix type of products that were out there um, that had a, a sharp ratio, I think, of seven at one point in 2017. Um, and that ultimately led to what was the, depending on who you ask, a Vomageddon or the VIX explosion um, when everything kind of unwound it in one day. Um, we do see in the market right now a downside skew or the ratio of implied volatility for out of the money puts relative to the out of the money options back to levels we've not seen since that time, suggesting that maybe people are not looking to hedge any sort of downside risk in the market. Um, so Allison, maybe I'll start with you. Can, can you help explain why this type of strategy that we've been talking about is really different than those short fix related products? Yeah, so I'll start off by giving kind of my my view on short vol strategies and how they work until they don't and how that adds into market dynamics. Um, you're right, being short vol in 2017 was a great trade at the time. And throughout the year, you kind of saw those short vol premiums getting lower and lower as more people got into the trade, but it didn't matter at the time. The market wasn't moving. Sure, you were making less money by collecting less premium, but it's still working out for you, right? Like you're still making money. Everything was great. You got more comfortable as time went on, got super overconfident maybe being like, I'm awesome. These are working out for me. Um, and it's really at that point of like that extended period of calm and then something happens, that's when the danger comes, right? And that's when we saw um, inverse fixed products, you know, do what they did to the market, everything like that. So generally that's kind of how, you can see this play out for these 
buy right ETFs in general, my take is they're generally safer um, just based on their, just how they're structured. A lot of them, they're probably like, they, they have probably 30 to 100% of their notional um, in the short calls. It's less levered than some of those products we saw in 2018. So when you just think of leverage in that way, you're like, okay, it's not quite the same. That's my take. That's not consensus view out there by any means. I know internally here, we have discussions on what this could do to the market. People have different opinions. We talked with a big bank last week, same thing of, you know, just differing opinions on the call at that point. Um, so I'd say when thinking about one of those different opinions, I can kind of give an example there so you can, you know, see what I'm talking yeah, about. Sure. Um, so take a cover call ETF, you know, stock going higher, you know, Yes, you're making on some of that exposure, but you also kind of need to be rebuying stock higher as you know those calls are being hit on everything like that. What you could see is that causing stock to drift higher based on demand. And then you get to a point where something happens in the market, stock needs to correct, and you're also losing money on that downside. Maybe there's outflows in the strategy and that could be something that, you know, breaks the market is a very big term. So I'm not going to say that, but just kind of adds to the magnitude that you might otherwise wouldn't have seen. So yes, I think it's safer, but I do just want to explain that just so everyone can kind of a little bit hear both sides of that. No, that, that's that's uh, totally fair. Ted, how do you think this potential change in market structure may impact and or how do you think about it in terms of how you guys manage risk? Uh, you know, we don't, I mean, really the market structure question. I don't think that's one that we're too concerned with, although being, being an ETF shop, I think I've been hearing market structure questions, you know, for, for yeah. you know, how we're going to break the market ourselves just as a wrapper. Um, yeah. So it's all your fault, Ted. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I, I definitely hasn't happened yet. But, um, uh, you know, from just from a Managing risk standpoint, I mean, I, th I think the biggest question is just, you know, is it leveraged? I think when you start entering leverage into the, these strategies, maybe if they're if they are, you know, uh, selling more options, you know, versus you know if they're over 100, percent you know, then I think you can get into uh, a little bit of trouble. Um, but you know, I'd agree with Allison. As long as they're kind of in that 30 to 100 percent range, then just from a risk standpoint, um, I think it's you know much safer than the you know the short volatility strategies, you know. Eric, any thoughts on this? I think there's a couple. Um, you know, the Volmageddon episode, it was it was fairly actually telegraphed, which is somewhat of an oxymoronic statement, right? It's like, how do you have Volmageddon when it was telegraphed? Like the prospectus of those instruments that created that were so well, widely known. Um, I just think the, the users within them um, relative to the professionals, like you're, the natural investor that was utilizing those asset allocations into those instruments were completely contrarian to the to the pros and so because of that the prospectus was very telegraphed i think the difference this time um not to say that there's no market structure risk because i do think there is some is it's all leverage number one and so vix has this notion of what i would classify as vol on vol um yeah. vvix is i think the barometer for it again yeah. vix is a barometer vvix is a barometer neither of them are perfect but they are somewhat indicative and the reality here is like buy rights in general zero dte the demand for options none of that is synonymous with vix and none of that is synonymous with vvix or vol of vol and so i think you truly need to absorb all of these things to make a fully educated assessment as to whether or not market structure can or cannot work given certain, you know, stress tests in the future. But the market's an efficient place. And so I think if the if the yeah. allocations are done with prudence, with any notion of risk management, then it, it'll be fine. I think, I think the real issue, number one, is leverage. But number two is just where you're allocated and you fully don't understand what you're allocated to. And so I think if if the market structure dynamics were in scope as to is the market 
working? The answer is yes. And frankly, I think it worked in Volmageddon, right? The, the, yeah. the challenge was, is who was invested, who got hurt and who reaped those rewards. But at the end of the day, like it was a telegraphed outcome in hindsight, it was very vivid, but even up and up until like, there was a lot of discussions on this topic that if and when it would happen, it'll be an I told you so moment and it happened. So like, know what you're investing in, do your own homework, I guess, is 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 the summary. Uh, and that's a fair point. I recall uh, an EQD conference nine months before Obamageddon where that topic was being talked about publicly, that this was yeah. an, an inevitability that was going to happen. It was just a question of when. So. I think you're right on that same point. And, and from this standpoint, you know, to the extent that, that, you know, you know, if market makers are the ones managing this risk on this, you always feel, to me, I always feel a bit more comfortable um, that they know how to, to sort through these different structural issues. Um, so Eric, maybe stick with you. And, uh, you know, this is a topic we've discussed before, the two of us, I know, but how should investors think about the, you know, the this impact on their portfolios from, and in these types of strategies, right? You know, you talked a little bit about people kind of coming in a, a little and talking, you know, with the with stocks that they own and maybe they want to think it's structured. How should how are we you talking to investors about using these types of strategies um to to impact the overall portfolio? Yeah, I think um there's a few themes in which we try to position our work. And and one of them is I'll call it the piece of the pie. Which piece of the pie are you allocating from? And if you're willing to open the paradigm to more than equities and fixed income into alts, then you have another layer to discuss. But I love the notion of if you allocate to equities through a cycle, five years, 10 years, 20 years, define your cycle. And I instead allocate to equities plus options, call it an overlay, call it a buy right, simple as it might be. Then from a sharp ratio perspective, I'll horse race that all day long if I have enough, if I have enough runway. Right. We might get snipped with a 2013, 2017, 2019 bull market low vol. But we're also going to get the 2022s where you have market down, high vol entering the market, and you make up a lot, a lot of ground. And so from a risk adjusted perspective, ex ante, let alone ex post. That's a wonderful dialogue for the cerebral allocator, right? But mm -hmm. I've also also been um, given feedback, and this is a valid point, that I can't eat my sharp ratio. I can only eat after-tax returns. And so now the notion is, well, then I need to either compensate it with a leverage ratio, of which we would shy away from, given all the notions and, and I'll call it anxiety around leverage, which we're supportive of. But now it's, can I take more equity risk with options inherently embedded at the expense of fixed income? And so now you have a tug of war on the equity risk premium dialogue, which is healthy, but folks often think of options buy right strategies as fixed income supplement. So the industry in its totality is working, I'll call it to create a new asset class, volatility risk premium, um, risk adjusted returns. These are these are all themes and forces that I think some allocators, some consultants, some CIOs will gravitate towards. But it's always in the eye of the beholder as to how you allocate a unit of risk capital to, I'll call it this panel's work. And my only silver bullet answer is it's a function of your time horizon. And so the longer your time horizon the more that equities plus an overlay or a buy right strategy to simplify it should be in your equity bucket. If you give us 20 years, if you give us 30 years, like an institution, you'll, you'll find yourself in that bucket. If you find yourself and I need to supplement income and I need a low vol, much like a risk parity allocation, like I want to target yeah. a seven vol. Now you're either the, you're in fixed income or you're in alts. And the only challenge you have in those allocations is that you're correlated to equities over the short run. And so it's really in the eye of the beholder, the allocator, as to where you want to place the allocation sleeve of the pie. Um, 
but again, my my silver bullet answer is the only answer that I've I've had conviction in for every allocation discussion is if you can give me your time horizon, I can better assess where you should place this allocation for benchmarking purposes. And maybe just a quick follow up. It's when you think about it. People have a different duration time time horizon as they look at this. Is that going to impact the implementation as well in terms of how or how or where you would look to use what which options you would look to to sell to implement the strategy? Um, I think at the end of the day, it's not the tenor of of the option selection. It's more about the duration to stay within the strategy. Okay. So whether I'm trading 30 days, 60 day, 180, 360 day options, that's a function of the vol environment and the asset class I'm, I'm trading in or the security that I'm trading in. Um, but the allocator that's coming into this, if they have a three month tactical view relative to a 20 year cap M efficient market hypothesis view, those are very different allocations. And so managing those expectations is is more art than science, but it's our job to educate our clients on how to allocate and how sh they should measure success. Um, Ted, I want to get your thoughts. Maybe it's slightly different, though. Uh, question is is when in, when investors are considering buy rights, what types of factors would you say that they, sh they should consider when comparing? different types of strategies, right? And some questions that usually come up is, should I use use call over rights or should I use um, you know, cash secure puts or underwrites? You know, one month versus three month option, you know, 100% of Delta covered, et cetera. What are, what are the types of ways that you think about it or that, that you think that investors should be considering as they consider these types of strategies? Yeah, you know, I guess I mean, there's a lot of different things to consider. And usually I, uh, you know, I, I kind of break it down into three things. Um, and I would agree with Eric on the idea of, you know, wanting to hold these for a longer term. I don't think that these strategies are like tactical tools at all. Um, so when, when we, you know, discuss these strategies, one is, you know, one thing you can think about, and they're all, these factors are related. So one is kind of like, what's your yield? You know, do you have a yield target you're looking for? Um, the, the second thing is, you know, what kind of upside capture and downside capture, you know, basically what kind of risk kind of reward profile do you want in the strategy? Um, because that can also kind of impact kind of what kind of yields you can capture. And the last thing is really um, kind of the, you know, option strategies are path dependent. And so different strategies have different sensitivity to that path dependency. And you know, so do you want to kind of look at what is your sensitivity to that? And so, so just kind of give an example. I mean, you know, if I wanted to, you know, get, if I was really worried about income, you know, I could sell an at the money option because that's where I'm going to collect the most premium. Um, but then again, I and maybe I, it gives me a little better performance if you have kind of a longer downtrending market. Um, so my downside capture is a little bit better. But obviously, you know, when you look at strategies that are like selling 2% out of the money, call options versus at the money over a long time period, those tend to outperform, right? Because they can capture that you know, if you believe that equity markets go up seven out of 10 years, you know, eight out of 10, uh, you know, you can capture that extra 2%. And so then maybe you may give up a little bit of yield, but you can capture, um, you know, the upside, you know, growth in the equity market. But the uh, path dependency question, I think is a important one, uh, because if, if I sell an at the money option, which is in a basic covered call strategy and I sell an at the money option and let's say I collect 2% in premium and over the, and I do a monthly option and a month later the market sells off 10%. So yes, I outperform, you know, I'm, I'm up 8% or down 8% versus the market down 10. But if at that point I roll the, roll the strategy and maybe even falls higher and I get 3% and then the market rallies back to unchanged, you know, I'm still down 5%, right? So we've kind of looked at strategies where we can kind of stagger that, whether that's using, you know, weekly options, you know, whether you want to roll your portfolio on a weekly basis, or do you want to stagger it where you're rolling a little piece every day or once, you know, you know, throughout time. So you kind of can mitigate that market movement and try to capture as, you know, market sells off, you can capture, you know, capture that higher vol and selling your premium. So it's really a game of trying to kind of, you know, put all those three things together. And that's not even getting into, you know, if I want to, you know, hedge some of my risk or with collars and things like that. So 
we kind of start with kind of looking at those three factors, just kind of what kind of yields you want, where, what kind of risk you're willing to take, and then kind of how do you want to handle the, you know, the path dependency. Okay. Um, I just want to remind everyone to put your um, questions into the Q&A box here on the chat, um, and we will get to those in a few minutes here. We're coming in the last couple of questions, and so I wanted to start queuing those up. I see some of them in the queue, and so continue to put those in there. Um, Allison, I want to come back to you and say, what, so when you, you know, when we're talking about professional option trading firms, et cetera, and you're, and you're looking at managing the risk in your portfolio, what, what thoughts can you give to investors about how they might want to think about, um, option strategies, buy rate strategies in, in the context of portfolio optim optimization or risk management, things that you've kind of learned tips, et cetera, that you might want to suggest other people should consider when they're looking at the risks in their portfolio. Yeah, for sure. So I'll kind of answer this in two ways. First one, if you're looking to trade this product, I think really it just goes to getting back to the basics of know the product you're trading, like understand what you're trading. We talked about, you know, Balmageddon, what happened there. I think that's a big one that people can underestimate, especially non-professionals. Two, how does it perform in various uh scenarios, just do some scenario analysis on what that looks like. And three, the important one is tie those scenarios into the rest of your portfolio. Are you, is adding this going to be hedging your risk elsewhere? Is it going to be adding to certain exposure? And like, honestly, those are the basics that anytime I'm looking at a portfolio at our firm, that's what I go back to. It sounds really simple, but that's a really good starting place to go to. Um, I'd say, if this is a product you're not trading, it's still really important to look at it and think about how it can still affect your portfolio. You know, we're not out here slinging covered call ETFs or anything like that, but it is still definitely affecting what we do at our firm. So thinking through those like second and third order effects can be really, really important. So for example, you know, these products have changed supply and demand in upside options. If you have something, you know, if you have a structured product like this coming in, selling vol at a certain delta or percent out of the money um, all the time, that implied volatility on those upside calls is probably going to be lower than it was before. And it's probably going to continue to act differently than what you would have expected before because that supply and demand has changed. Um, so that's one thing that, you know, one example of, you know, tying that into something we need to think about here more and that vol level might not rise at this, you know, time you would have thought on a certain size move or certain news in the market, because it really kind of goes back to like, what are the flows going to be doing there? Like, are these products just going to be like, yeah, we're still doing what we're doing. Did something change? Like, those are things you need to think about. Um, and not just kind of reply, uh, rely on what happened in the past, like, hey, this should be acting this certain way. Like, no, something has changed in the market. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I think in particular, I, I noticed one thing that I hear much more discussion of than, than before is every single day, everyone's talking about pin risk and, and where where the market's going to pin, et cetera. And when you talk about the, how the there's certain flows can, can impact the market performance, and you have to understand what's going on with that. Absolutely. Getting back to those basics. Um, mm -hmm. Eric, I want to come back to something you said earlier. Um, when you talked about you know the duration or, or the time horizon for a particular investor and whether this is an alternative to an equity allocation or a, big, a fixed income allocation or or an alternative, maybe even hedge fund type of uh, head allocation. Um, do you see any sort of trends or patterns as, as to where people, I mean, I can I understand your part point of, of how they can be considered each of those, but do you see any trends of where people are actually using them more more often? Um, for the taxable investor, the answer is yes, because it's being delivered from their core equity sleeve, right? So whether they're running ETFs, whether they're running mutual funds, whether they're running individual names, the idea is I'd like to de-risk, I'd like to provide income, I'd like to improve sharp ratios, and yes, tax is potentially a catalyst. But the, the genesis of the conversation starts with their equity portfolio. I think so for that for that classification, you're 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 sleeving into the equity world. I think the other 
astute investment conversation is I have cash to put to work. And so this has this notion of like, oh, well, then I don't want to buy S&P 5000, but I'd like to buy S&P 4500 and six months out. And I'd like to get paid to wait to buy the dip. Common allocator discussion. And so the concept here is, well, own treasuries, own high grade, you know, investment grade fixed income and allocate to put writing. So we all know on this call that owning stocks and selling calls is the simultaneously equivalent of, you know, owning the same instrument and selling puts and owning treasuries. But for the allocator, that's not the same. And so what you're trying to solve for is, yes, their allocation, you know, I'll call it optimization, but also like where, where they're trying to be tactical, maybe too cute, where they think of, what is synonymous from a risk reward perspective to, to a derivatives person, but is different in the eyes of the allocator. So those are very inverse lenses, but risk reward identical. And so selling puts owning treasuries versus owning stocks and selling calls is a large, large discussion, which will dictate where they allocate to, and I'll call it their allocation model. Yeah, it, you're absolutely right that knowing the, the actual versus synthetic is, you can't, you know, you, they're absolutely similar strategies and, but that's a very, very different conversation. That's a yep. very interesting one. So Ted, I'm going to have the last question for you before we turn to Q&A. Um, this is something we had talked about before is that besides some of these buy right ETFs, do you see other option type of ETFs in the market or soon to come to the market? Um, for instance, like structured product ETFs or something like that. And can you tell us more about those? Yeah, I mean, I think the other area of, you know, large growth in the ETF space has been the defined outcome strategies, which, you know, to simplify those, they're effectively, you know, buying a, at the money put, selling a, let's say, 20% out of the money put a year out, and then they sell a call option, upside call option and use that premium to effectively pay for the put spread. And so then they, you know, then they basically have, let's say, five to eight percent upside and and no downside to twenty percent kind of thing. You know, I'm generalizing, but but that's that's kind of been the area where we've seen a lot of growth. You know, there are also some defined outcome strategies that are looking to, you know, up in a short, you know, in a certain price window, give you you know double the return with the same amount of downside risk. So, so those defined outcome strategies are becoming more and more popular. So that that's probably the other main area of growth outside of uh, just covered calls. Yeah, it's interesting. Kind of going back to Allison's point about the democratization of options trading. I mean, those that's usually the uh, the investment bank uh, purview, and and having some of that come to to the retail account near you is a, is an interesting idea. Okay, yeah. we're just going to go with. There's a few questions that are out there. Again, you feel free to send more in if you have them. Um, I'm going to just throw this out, and whoever wants to to answer it go for it and uh, we'll kind of go from there. Okay. So we have first question is about thoughts on buy right closed end funds, which offer some very wide discounts now. Um, of course, a lot of liquidity risk premium there too. So, but anyone want to jump on buy right closed end funds? Any thoughts on that? I'll take it. I, uh, yeah. I used to work at river North, which is one of the largest closed end fund arbitrage shops in the country. So I have a, Good insight here. You, you're a um, man. Then. Close and fund premiums and discounts are very interesting phenomenons. They they will have mean reversion tendencies until they don't, and the asset class interest often dictates the length of time that they don't mean revert. And so, what that simply means is our buy right close and funds at a discount or a larger than normal discount and interesting investment. My, my response to that is twofold. Um, if you're bullish on equities, then having a discount as a tailwind is a good, is a good thing to have. Right. So that that's one natural uh, I'll call it alpha stream, but your time frame to an expectancy to have the discount mean revert to call it par has a whole host of forces within it. And yes, there are proxies. Yes, there are activists. Yes, there are notions to close that discount. But the number one thing is the interest in the asset class and the interest in equities and or vol risk premium buy right strategies in general. 
And so while you have equities at all time highs, um, I could argue both sides of this coin pretty equitably, which would say that the interest level should be higher. But for tactical reasons, you might have folks de-risking themselves away from, from the asset class. Um, so there's an accordion effect with all discount and premium relationships. I think the most statistically significant one is within fixed income in periods of duress. They trade like equity discounts, but their NAVs should be you know, performing with fixed income volatility. So there, there's real arbitrage and relative value to exploit here. Um, but the supply and demand forces to have a discount narrow, your timeline is 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 very challenging to to assess. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think um, it's not a, a buy right discount or a close in fund, but I think many may be familiar with the grayscale Bitcoin and, e and Ether uh, closed end funds um, that had material discounts for quite some time. And I think when you talk about interest in the in the asset class um leading to mean reversion or lack thereof i think those are other great examples of it can take it can close but it can take a lot longer than you think to close um unless you know what you're doing um i'm gonna throw this one out there next question is what are the pros and cons to managing a covered call strategy for a client um with five hundred thousand to one million employer stock I, reading that, what are the pros and cons of doing it yourself versus perhaps just investing in one of these products, perhaps? Anyone, any thoughts? What about what about just the general difficulties logistically one might have in managing this type of strategy on their own, even in their own accounts? I'm, I'm happy to opine. Yeah. Um, so RSUs, employer stock, ESOPs, et cetera, are assets usually held away and custodied um, in a different paradigm than somebody's self-managed brokerage account. And so the challenge will be whether or not you can support the hedging or the buy right of that position in an, in an independent account for Reg T purposes. And so what you outline, um, your risk might be parapasu equitable for, for the investor or the client but you have operational margin constraints to consider. And so it's feasible, but you have a, you need other assets to support, I'll call it that program. And then with respect to like the in-house versus do it yourself versus outsource, like trading options, if you're not a professional is a meticulous mundane, I'll call it, I won't say high risk, but um, relative to the reward, right? It's not so much the PL from the trading, it's the act of doing it correct and then allocating it appropriately. So there are a lot of operational burdens depending upon the infrastructure that you sit on, just depending upon your practice, whether you're do it self or you know, for an individual, meaning yourself or on behalf of other clients. And so the paradigm here is 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 large um in scope, but at the end of the day, like the business of trading options is it's scalable with the right resources, with the right time, with the right focus, with the right business model um, and with the right technology. And so if you add all that up, you can you can definitely facilitate it. Um, but there are a lot of operational constraints that that some are aware of and some won't know until they get in and try it themselves. Um, and so that's that's kind of the the genesis of part of the reason that that clients hire us. Terrific. Um, Allison, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send this one to you next because we were talking before about how you are managing traders now as well as managing options portfolios. What are the common characteristics to successful options investors or options traders? And what's common to some of the unsuccessful cases? Oh man, you're putting me on the spot. Hopefully I am. My this is probably so someone that works with you asking this question. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'd say common characteristics of successful traders. One, and kind of what Eric was going into just now, you need to be really solid on your options theory foundation in order to be successful. Putting on a trade, even if stock doesn't move, your p &L fluctuates and the risk of your position fluctuates even if stock does nothing. Passage of time, volatility going higher or lower, interest rates changing, 
there's a lot that goes into it. So the number one thing is just really being super solid on those foundations. Two, I think the ability to really be able to separate out good decisions and P&L and bad decisions in P&L is a big one as well. There's going to be times when you had a really solid thesis and the trade didn't work out. It's not going to feel great, but knowing that is important and it helps kind of build that process of how do I know I have a good process when analyzing, you know, my ideas and my trades. And just as important when a trade works out, but being able to know like, oh, I missed something on this thesis. I kind of got lucky. That's really important. Um, and that can be really tough for people to do. And I'd say it's one of the biggest barriers we see uh, people come in at our firm and probably a lot of firms because, you know, we like to think we hire really smart people and smart people aren't always used to being wrong. So um, the market has a way of telling you that, you know, every once in a while, as I'm sure you guys know. Um, so I'd say those are, if I had to pick two things, those are the top two. Awesome. Um, Ted, I'm going to throw this one at you. Um, how have flex options changed the landscape, if at all? Yeah, I mean, the flex options have, um, you know, they've definitely been, they're heavily utilized in the defined outcome, you know, options. So, um, I just think it gives a lot more flexibility, especially to um, fund managers like myself uh, and how we, you know, we can be very specific in putting on the positions and they're exchange traded, which in an ETF wrapper that our clients typically want things that are exchange traded, not although we do trade swaps and things like that. Um, so I, I think that's kind of the, really the, the liquidity on exchange is kind of the main main benefit for people like us. You know. Okay. Um La last or I got the yeah, last question I see in here right now uh, for anyone is how do you compare the cost of using these strategies, these buy right strategies, to manage a portfolio in a tax efficient way compared to a more common tax efficient strategy? Um, that's the question. I don't I don't know what that more common tax efficient strategy would be, but um, any thoughts? I. I would look at it from the landscape of where your starting point is. Um, so if you have low basis anything and you're trying to reposition it, um, selling it, paying tax and reallocating is is a friction relative to putting cash to work in a, I'll call it a horse race. Um, the notion of mutual funds, and this is the the the, the metaphor that I often use with our clients is, Mutual funds were disrupted by ETFs and direct indexing tax managed equities is, is starting to take food from the ETF space because of the after tax value proposition. So SMA options are the same exact metaphor, which is you have more degrees of freedom to tax loss harvest if you have more instruments. And so this is all about after tax and then the wrapper that which you're facilitating the return stream. And so if you have that degree of freedom and you have the discretion with that degree of freedom as the investor slash allocator or portfolio manager, depending upon which lens you're looking from, then the the value proposition should be clear. Um, but it's it's a complete function of your starting point. What's your basis? What do you hold? Am I putting cash to work? What's my timeline? Timeline for six months, like taxes are irrelevant. That's a short term gain, whether you want to view it that way or not that that's a trade that's not a strategy that's not an allocation um the longer your time frame your your, your vantage point matters and the more degrees of freedom you have to tax less harvest the better off your after tax returns will be awesome i think on that note uh we will end it we're out of questions and out of time so allison ted eric thank you all very much uh, this was a great discussion really enjoyed it and for those um, that are on here. And for those that are on here, we're going to record this and host it on our CFA Chicago website under the digital content. So you can come back and listen to these thoughts and then hopefully learn a little bit more. I know we dug into some things that people might want to go and Google and say, what were they talking about? I'm going to go Google and find out and, and go back and listen again. So that, that that's an opportunity that's out there for you. So thank you all very much for joining us today. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Rich. Thank you, guys. See you. Have a good night, everyone.